Hey everybody and welcome back to Exotic Car Hacks. Today we're going to be talking about something very simple. How did I know that the Earth and G63 markets were going to drop significantly, especially over the last six months? So for the last year and a half, I've been asked by many of my members at Exotic Car Hacks, at our community. If you don't know what that is, you can click the link in the description. It will take you and give you the opportunity to join one of the greatest online communities of exotic car owners anywhere. Uh, and in addition to that, it also teach you how to get in and out of exotic cars by lowering your ownership costs significantly and not losing money on exotics like you have in the past. But my members have asked me over and over, how did I know that the Urus market and the G63 market were simply not going to hold? Uh, and they were going to drop. So, you know, in the world of cars, we have this thing called supply and demand. And realistically, let's go to what we call pre-2019, or should I say pre-2020, right? Like the 2019 era. Cars that were in high demand and in very low supply would go up. This is a very normal thing in exotics. It's always been the case. One of the reasons why uh, earlier on, during the early phases, uh, like these exotics held and then in the middle, they started depreciating much heavier is because this, the supply increased significantly with the rise of what we call mid-level exotics. Remember for a long time, exotics were not attainable by most people until they came out with models like Gallardos, 570Ss, and cars basically that were so streamlined that it, and they were much cheaper. They were basically a 200K alternative opportunity because remember in like for example 2005 if you had a Mercy Lago you still had a $400,000 car well in 2005 $400,000 is the equivalent of like basically having a million dollars now so what I'm trying to say is that back then you were really rich if you had a $400,000 car but when they started introducing $200,000 car well that was still a big stretch back then that wasn't that big of a stretch for most people that already had Range Rovers, Mercedes, and nice cars that were already spending 100 grand on the car. So it was a transition, and it was a really good move by the exotic car industry to basically move people on. But something that was really interesting is that the supply started obviously mass producing a lot more. Demand started going up. People said, you know what, I can afford a Gallardo. So they started making a ton more Gallardos than they made Marcelagos. And so it started to make sense. The cars were reliable. People started to buy more. So there became the, the start of trying to mainstream exotics. And that's what's happened over the last two years. Well, when they wanted to mainstream exotics, the next step to that was to offer an exotic that was more than just a weekend car and enter sports utility like SUVs, like the Lamborghini and the high-end SUVs that are basically exotic car SUVs, right? We could look at the Cullinan, the Urus, the Bentayga, almost every manufacturer, including Ferrari now, has some SUV variant that they basically use as, listen, this is for those of us that need a car to go to work every day or need a car to take their kids around, but still want a Lamborghini or Ferrari. And so there came the introduction, increasing supply even more. And so entering demand from a brand new market, which are individuals that previously thought about the brands, but never actually made a move. So in 2020, these specific SUVs, which previously were very popular, but certainly not popular uh, enough to warrant a huge premium over sticker because the supply was always meeting the demand at least, right? Because still it takes some money to own like a $300,000 SUV. So the, what happened is in 2020, the pandemic happened, right? And as a result of the pandemic, something really interesting happened in the entire market. And this is called the luxury Main Street event. Now, this is what basically I called back in 2020, which when at the beginning of COVID, I bought an SVJ for 400 grand. Everybody told me I was crazy that SVJ went to 700 grand in like less than like three months after. But the point I'm trying to make here is that what happened during this event is something that a lot of people don't talk about. And I think it's really important to talk about it to understand the philosophy and psychology of why certain things are settling back down now, instead of just broadly being ignorant and saying markets are crashing or this is happening. It's not just what's happening. So what happened, uh, uh, there's the watches too, in 2020, America got a taste of mainstreamed luxuries, which means more people had money because they certainly did not have, these, these guys, they did not have debt to repay. Their loans were frozen, so they didn't have to pay their debt, their student loan, their mortgages, their car notes. 
In addition to that, they got stimulus money. In addition to that, they got PPE loans. So all this money started flooding the market. And when money floods the market and you don't have to pay your debt, well, something really interesting happens. Demand goes ways up. But here's what was interesting about this demand. It wasn't demand from your typical user base. It was new demand. And it was new demand that didn't previously exist because of this event. So when this event took place, new demand took place. And new demand came at a phase so strong that it pushed luxuries, like these two things, that were never meant to be over sticker because they were mass produced luxuries. And it started pushing them on the very basis of simple economics. You have three of these, we have 10 of us, we'll pay a little bit more for it, but we don't want this other guy to have it because I don't want to wait. So everything has a price. And when you live in a capitalistic society, this takes effect, right? But this luxury mainstreamed event that took place basically gave a taste of luxury to a lot of these people who, were, who became new players in the game. Now there's something good about that because you could say that even though people made a lot of mistakes and they bought stuff they shouldn't have and they got screwed and they thought the crypto mania would go on forever, something really interesting happened. When, when people that don't have the means typically get a taste of things that people with means have, they typically get inspired and don't want to go back. So this is a good thing because it helps people. I've always said if they touch, play, and participate, they're less likely going to stay poor. So that was a really good thing for that. I think and there was a positive to it. The negative is that obviously poor people don't know how to manage money. So paying 50K over for an earth just made perfect sense. They didn't use tools like exotic car hacks. They used tools like, I'm looking on AutoTrader. I think I got a pretty good deal. So that's the kind of stupid that basically pushed these pricing up. Now, dealers saw this coming and they said, listen, there's so much demand, we can't even buy these cars anymore from other dealers. So we have to raise the price to make more per unit. And so came the dealer buying from dealer, buying from dealer, buying from dealer, buying from dealer. So this happened in the watch game too. There is one key indicator we look at as a risk. It's still a game you have to play. You don't really have a choice if you're in the business. So it's not like we could say, well, dealers shouldn't play this game or why did jewelers do this? It's just a game. So, but as a consumer, you have to pay attention to it. Whenever the guy who's trying to beat you at the game is another dealer and another dealer and another dealer, and you're the only consumer trying to buy the asset, you have to understand that you're in a very interesting place in an inflationary period for whatever asset you're pursuing. So in other words, if you're buying an earth, but I as a dealer may be trying to buy it, or John as a dealer is trying to buy it, or Casey as a dealer is trying to buy it to resell it, and you're also competing with us, you have to start realizing that there is something going on here and that there's inflated demand that isn't real because we're basically all fighting for an asset because the asset is significantly in short supply. Even in collector markets, like even when you're talking about McLaren P1s, Carrera GTs and super high -end cars that do meet the low supply and, and higher demand equilibrium because of its extreme low supply, like 100 units, 1,000 people that can afford it, you still run into a mode where dealers aren't taking bets on those cars. So this is the difference. When you have a McLaren P1, for example, you have a dealer buying, as an example, as 1.4, Retail is 2 million. So now you have a 600K margin. Why? Because the dealer takes a bet at 1.4 and says, hey, I'm gonna keep this for a while. It probably won't sell, but I'm gonna try to get two or 1.6, whatever. A consumer comes in here and gives this dealer a small margin and therefore becomes a better buyer than another dealer at 1.6. And therefore that's how a deal happens. 1.6, dealer accepts 200 more, but it's better than another dealer buying. The other dealer doesn't necessarily have interest in the asset. It will do that if the price is cheap enough. It will not lock its money just to find out if it can or can't bring 2-0. It will think to itself, can I, what are my odds? What is the dollar where I can take a chance to basically exit this asset? This is a real equilibrium of a real exotic car. This going from 220 to 240 between three dealers to 270 to 350, like these batches right here aren't user bought. These are dealer bought. Dealer buys, dealer sells at 220, next dealer buys uh, at 220 and sells at 240. The one buying at 240 and selling at 270 is a dealer, 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 and the end user at 350. So what I'm trying to say here, what you have to understand is when that's happening, these scenarios where dealers are outpacing each other and premium paying retail money for cars, that is a significant increase in demand from the main market. 
This has happened with watches too, dealers buying each other's watches and then basically ending up with whoever has the last bid is gonna set the new market and hold that market. The argument here is that these are things you can see if you're in the game. This is some of the things I was teaching people at Exotic Car Hacks is since I'm in the game, I can see all this and I can tell you, wow, like this car, the Urus and the G63, a lot of these guys bidding on this stuff, overbidding each other aren't people that wanna drive these cars. They're resellers that wanna make money. So we saw this with, with NFTs, right? There's no real value in a picture of a monkey on your screen. It's maybe worth two grand because of its utility, but people are making it worth 10 million, whatever, 5 million, 2 million, 500,000. Because, not because they understand what the monkey does or the significance of the monkey in their life, but because they believe that whatever they spend, someone else will spend more and will make the money. This mania just driving up is basically the risk factors in inflationary markets where you look at cars that are not supposed to go up, go up, like pictures of monkeys that aren't supposed to be worth more, be worth more. So you can see the similarities in watches and cars occurring at the same time. In these particular cars, this has been happening since 2020. And so I called it back then, I said, these are very risky cars. And while you can hack them short term at the time, six months, seven months, eight months, you would have probably been fine if you started early because you're gonna even make money. I just said it's just a risky thing because remember hacking a car is not about flipping a car, it's about driving it for 12 to 16 months, enjoying it, adding miles, and then getting rid of it, which means that you have to basically uh, be able to forecast from here all the way to here and maybe what could come after because the car could go back to 260 here. And the problem at 260 is that if you're here or here, you got killed. If you're here and here, you did okay. So at this stages, it makes sense to buy early on. But once you get to the middle stages, it doesn't make time, it doesn't make sense to buy anymore. So one of the things I was telling my students is that, hey, don't buy these cars because they're riskier depending on when they came to me asking should I buy an Urus or not. Some students did really well because early on they bought them. I told them to buy them early and at a low price. They did. Some others uh, chose to take their own path and say, hey, I'm gonna risk this. Some broke even, some lost money. But I'm telling you today, this is the way we look at markets and this is the granular level in which we do things at Exotic Car Hacks. We analyze markets, we understand why they're happening and this is the core of what we do as a community. So I just wanted you guys to understand this, why it was very easy to call out the Earth and the G63. And the question I get a lot, which is gonna come is, am I now in a good time to be hacking these things? Well, these things have resumed normal depreciation schedules, which are anywhere from five to 7% a year. So expect demand to still stay strong, but something interesting happened in the meantime, while all of this was going on and things are coming back down, the new Urs is significantly more money than the old Urs. The new G63 is more money than the old G63, thanks to a price increase, not because of dealer markups. So because of these things, the price has now gone up. So the base model is now much more expensive than it was three years ago. So a 2019 G63, you could buy for like 160 brand new. Now a 2022 G63 is gonna run you 220. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's now a $60,000 difference between the old G63 and new G63, and they look exactly the same. So what does that mean? Well, as we plan values based on where stickers are, stickers on new ones are significantly more expensive. So you're gonna see that equilibrium on 21, 22, and 23 cars hold really strong versus older cars kind of start to settle back down where they should be. Now, this is just very important to understand because the same thing happens to the Urus, but it is why right now you could buy a 2019 for both the G63 and the Urus at a significantly lower price than its counterparts later on, which is technically the exact same car, and get it at a very, very good dollar, and it would give you a lot of room to be able to hack it over the next 12 months, regardless of what happens in any economy. And that is how that becomes now finally a good hack. So if you wanna learn more, again, click the link and take our free training. If you're ready to join Exotic Car Hacks, click the link and actually join our community. And more importantly, like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and please tell me, uh, what do you think about my analysis? Do you think now the Earth market and the G63 from 2019 have finally settled or am I too crazy? I'll catch you next time on an Exotic Car Hacks video.